you ask anybody who hit a game winning home run or had a great poker play and won a big pot or won a tournament, how many fucking times did they tell that story? Thousands, right? And every time they do that, that's an experience. Telling in a story of what happened. And when you tell that story and you recall it, you get a little bit of the endorphins, the same situations and relive it, right? And that's a dividend. You get a piece of that. When you put money in a bank, right? You can only withdraw so much before you're out of money. You put an experience or memory in the bank, you can withdraw infinitely. Hi, it's Ranchix. Welcome to my podcast. Today, my guest is Bill Perkins, the author of Die With Zero, a fantastic book. I found it a great read and I was thrilled to have this conversation with Bill. There are so many takeaways in this one. We talk a lot about some of the concepts from the book. So if you enjoy this conversation, you will definitely like the book. It's packed with actionable advice, and for some, it might be a life-changing read. I know it opened my eyes to some ideas which I haven't thought about before. And of course, we talk a bit about poker. As you might know, in his free time, Bill is playing some of the high-stakes games in the world, and his little rant about professional poker players towards the end of this episode is priceless. It's just the kind of advice and straight talk some people really need to hear. I personally found this conversation very useful, and if you haven't already, subscribe to my newsletter, In it, I share my summary of key takeaways from each new episode. Signing up is very easy. Just go to runchixpodcast.com. That's run, C-H-U-K-S, podcast.com. The rest is straightforward and it's free. And now, please enjoy this conversation with Bill Perkins. Well, Bill, thank you for making the time. Really, really appreciate it. Loved your book and I'm so looking forward to this conversation. All right. Glad to be here. I'm glad you loved it. I'm glad you got value out of it. You know. That's, oh, absolutely. That's why I wrote it. <laughs> absolutely. And and you know what? I read it twice. It's one of those books I think that is worth reading a couple of times. One of those books, good to keep it on your shelf because there's going to be different takeaways at different stages of your life. I'm quite certain about it. So, yeah, I could see that. I could definitely mm. see that. And and it, you know, there's a book called um, uh, Your Money or Your Life, which I've gone back to several times Mm -hmm. but it's it's a foundational book to like the construct of the way i thinking my my way of thinking and um the four agreements i i go back to that constantly Mm -hmm. constantly right right and i know you've mentioned this book in uh in your book and some of the foundational things that that you mentioned that and i think we we might actually come back to this book you know i want to start with something that I found really interesting. Just a small mention that you made in the book, but still, I found it interesting because you you talked about how the movie Wall Street yes. inspired you to get into the finance industry. Can you talk a bit about that experience? Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I think most people have seen this movie, Wall Street. It's, it's uh, the Sheens, right? Charlie and Martin Sheen. It's about the the, the movie's ultimately about greed, and it, it focuses on a, a young stockbroker trying to make it, uh, getting in touch with a whale and becoming his broker. But the the whale is does a lot of nefarious things, uh, illegal things in order in his pursuit of money, right? And and, and the, the movie's kind of like to what ends, right? But there's a lot of uh, Glitz and glamour, the lifestyle, you know, the big giant, you know, brick as a cell phone type of thing, talking on the beach, which back then, like, who had a cell phone, you know, <laughs> and, 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 and the parties and the art and the fancy apartment and, you know, kind of like the, the painting, the picture of when it to be rich, which was freedom, right, you know, um, and that was very, very appealing to me. So mm-hmm. I, I was like, hey, I, I don't, there are things i more interested in, right? But from my, eye, from my lens, it was like the path to get to the things you were more interested in and to be able to do the things you want to do was through acquiring capital, tons of mm-hmm. it, right? Like you want to make a movie? You got the money? You make a movie. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> you want to be an artist? You make it a studio, you do art. Like you can afford it, you can do that, right? Like you're not begging and studios and let me direct your movie. You're the fucking boss, right? And so that idea of freedom through leverage and having tons of capital really, really appealed to me. And I was like, okay, that's what I want to do. Right. And it wasn't what I wanted to do because I love that. What I wanted was the lifestyle that was being painted to me in this Mm -hmm. movie. Right. Like I was like, oh, wow, these guys make a lot of money and there's a lot of them. Right. Like, it's not just like 
one guy is the heavyweight champ in the world, right? Like he makes all the money and everybody else gets knocked out and gets peanuts, right? right. It's yeah. like, there's a bunch of these guys. So that, that was, that was loomed large on my impressionable mind, you know, like that mm-hmm. kind of that lifestyle and, and that path. Mm. Interesting. You know why I asked this question? Because when I read that, I remember the story that uh, an author, Michael Lewis, I don't know if you know Michael, well, he wrote um, Moneyball, he, he wrote yeah. The Big Short, you know, but his first Liar's fantastic Poker. book with Liar's Poker, I'm glad yes, you know it, so you yes. know the book, right? <laughs> yeah, I know it well. <laughs> and it's a fantastic book. He wrote it because I listened to an interview with him and he said that he wrote it originally because he was pissed with the industry. He thought this is this is crap, you know, the, and I want to tell people about it. I want to write a cautionary tale about the greed in the investment banking or whatever type of banking he was he was in. Right. So he wrote a cautionary tale, put it out there, proud of his book, thinks it's an amazing thing. As soon as it got published, he received countless uh, inquiries from young guys asking, where do we sign up? Your book yeah. is great inspiration. We want to go there. <laughs> this, <laughs> this banking thing, this exactly. is amazing. Right? Exactly. And then yeah, I so, thought, exactly the same thing, right? Wall Street is a cautionary tale about exactly, greed yeah. act and, and the excesses of capitalism and the pursuit of money. And I'm just like, Consequences, consequences, make me rich. <laughs> you know, I don't want to hear that shit. I want to get rich. <laughs> right. I just, I, I found the parallel quite interesting. And obviously you wrote a book and you don't know how people are going to perceive it. What are they going to be the takeaways? But what is your wish? What do you hope that people are going to get from the book? Well, there's, there's two ways to look at it. I mean, the, the, the main thing is, is I hope I'm saving people's life, right? Like when I, when I, when I was writing this book and working with the, the ghostwriter and talking to people, it's like, this book is a lifesaver, right? People are throwing away their lives working for money that they're never going to spend. They're delaying gratification, experiences, visits with relatives, treasured moments to a time in which they will never execute on them. These hours are all they got. They're live. I have 12,900 hours approximately. Some, some people have 20,000 hours, 15,000. That's all you got and the choices you make in them. And people on autopilot, not making choices, throwing away their hours. And at their end of their life, people are gonna spend a ton of money, whether it's the state, their, their estate, friends and relatives, to try and keep them alive for an extra two to six months, mm. right? And they're improperly allocating their resources at the, at, the, at the wrong time, such that they waste their life. So I look at the book as saving lives, right? So that's one way I look at it. It's a lifesaver. It's the most effective life giver there is, right? 24 bucks or download it for free on Amazon Prime and take soak in the mental models and you get your life back. You get a more fulfilling life. Um, the other way I look at it is like, I want the velocity of money to go up. So when I write this book, right, that says die with zero, use all your resources in order to have the experiences of your choosing, right? I'm helping you. I'm helping you get off autopilot and I'm helping you get the things you want out of your life before you hit the grave. I'm helping your friends and loved ones around you are going to have these cherished experience in in things around you. But I'm also helping the economy at large because when you spend your money and your resources to have experience, it doesn't go into hyperspace. It doesn't go out. It goes into the guy who takes you on the hiking trip up the trail and the yoga instructor and the tour instructor and the plane ticket operator and the so-and-so and the so-and-so. And that money goes out and they're able to use it and fulfill their dreams. And so the velocity of money goes up. It helps everyone. So that's the broader, big, hairy ass goal that Hmm. to change the culture, right? Like, so you say, Bill, what's your most fantastical goal for this? It's like to change the fucking culture. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's a, you know, a big goal. Yeah, It's like, it's the most fantastic of ones, right? (laughs) Like, it's not like, hey, I think I'm going to go automatically do it. But it's like, if you said, hey, God's going to grant you the wish, you know, this becomes so big because as everybody thinks this through and has these mental models, that's what happens, mm. right? Money gets yeah, put to yeah. work. People get to put to work. Lives get changed to hand, right? Like the whole, we have uh, Fed printing trillions of dollars trying to get money moving around our economy, right? Like mm. just chase your dreams and you'll get money moving around the economy. Yeah. Just live your life fully and you'll get money moving around the economy. Mm. I love the goal. And I think... The book is working towards it, you know. I 
and we're going to zoom in on some of the concepts from the book, I think, okay. a bit later. First, I want to ask you about, because, you know, this book, obviously, you hope it's going to change somebody's life. What were the defining moments for you that changed your life? You mentioned one of those in the book, uh, this interaction with your uh, former boss. Um, yeah. Forgot was his uh, first Joe name. Farrell. Farrell. Joe, Joe Farrell. Farrell. Yeah. yeah. Farrell. All yeah. right. So your interaction with him was yeah. sort of a tipping point for yourself. Is that right? Yeah. I think it took, it took uh, many punches to the face to get me to pay attention. But yeah, like it took a There were all these things... You know, I, I look at it as like, well, what, what, what got you there? It's like, you ever watch those movies where it's a mystery and at the end, the guy's like, oh, yeah. And they do the flashbacks and it's like mm. the coffee cup, felt, like at the, the usual suspects, right? The coffee mug and the thing. And he, he ties it all together. Right. So it wasn't just one thing. Right. It's all these things come synthesize and it all hits you and it all points at one direction. Right. Mm. Um, you know, the experience with Joe Farrell when I was like a young clerk um, making no money. Right. Like sixteen thousand, seventeen thousand dollars a year, a little bit more because I was driving a limo at night to make ends meet. And um, I saved. Uh, I saved a thousand dollars. You know, we were talking about it and I'm, I'm like talking what a, you know, Joe Farrell's here. I'm talking whatever. He's kind of listening in. I'm thinking I'm getting a gold star. I'm bragging. I'm like, look at me. I saved this money. I'm so fucking frugal. Like, aren't I great? And he's like, you what? You're a fucking idiot you know <laughs> and i'm thinking like this is somebody you look up to who's the traitor who you want to be <laughs> you're thinking you're doing something great like you're the best in class and he's calling me a fucking idiot and you know and he's explaining he's like you, you came here to make millions you didn't come here you think you're gonna be making sixteen thousand dollars your whole goddamn life go and spend that money like what are you doing right and it hit me it hit me like a ton of bricks i was like he's right like mm -hmm. not only was did i come there for the future opportunity and expect to make more money but I chose not to be a waiter where I could be making 3x to 4x the money there, right? Like I could just walk out the place and make more money. So why was I, why was I saving and depriving my younger, poorer self of experiences in order to give them to my future richer self? It was so ass backwards. And I, I thought I was doing the right thing, right? Because I was part of the culture of you just save dutifully, blah, blah, blah. And by the time you're 65, you were, can retire and go on a carnival cruise, right? Like that was mm. the culture that was stuck in my head. And, and, that, and that was a hit, you know, like, like that kind of, sh that shifted me. And um, I talk about the book, Your Money or Your Life. You know, that book was, was amazing, um, I have another friend who read it. He's like, yeah, that book changed my life. Like a lot, it changes a lot of people's life and has actually started a movement called the fire movement. The, the money of your life is kind of like the, the Bible to the um, fire movement, which is the financial independence retire early movement, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's all about realizing that you exchange hours, the, the definition that holds the most of what money, there's a lot of definitions of money, right? Medium exchange, whatever. But the definition that holds the most is something you exchange hours of your life for. And with that, the whole book, in probably a didactic fashion, goes through painfully exercises in which you look at every single penny that comes into your life, every single penny that goes out, how many hours you work for it, what the net, and you get to your true hourly wage. Mm -hmm. And once you've done that painfully over time, then you remove the money and you think of everything in hours. Right? And so... That shirt wasn't $17. That shirt was two hours of work. You know what I mean? After tax, after net, after transportation, after whatever. And so then you, it viscerally gets you in touch with, wow, I'm exchanging hours of my life for these experiences of buying a shirt or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so that sets up the foundation for me to go, okay, um, you know, seeing these rich people when they're older and they're rich then, I'm just like, you know, I was biased. I was young, right? Like somebody who was 50 back then was fucking ancient to me, you know, as a young 20. So there were tons of rich people on the exchange and on Wall Street, but they all seemed to be older. And I was just like, what's the use of being rich when you're that old? Hmm. Now, I was completely off on magnitude, but I kind of had the direction right, right? Because what's the use of being getting rich at 90 on your deathbed, right? Not that much use, right? The utility. So I was on to the fact that there is a utility of money that changes with time. 
right? Because if when I ran it backwards, like what's the use of having a trillion dollars when you're a baby in your bed? Nothing. You're going to shit on it and gum it, right? Like there's nothing you can do with it, right? And so I, I got to thinking about that curve and when the optimal, I used to start thinking, when's the optimal time to be rich, right? And then, you know, those thoughts were reinforced by other events or came back over time. And I was trying to find a formula like, oh, when's the optimal time? And if you want to get all the experiences and everything out of life, you should be ending with zero money. So there's got to be a curve to spend down to zero. What does that curve look like? When is the peak? You know, is the peak a number? And I was like, wait, the peak shouldn't be a number. It's a date. It doesn't matter how much money you have. Once your health starts deteriorating, the future value of money, the ability to convert into experiences uh, would deteriorate faster than any return that you can get, Right. And that's the concept of personal interest rate. So all these things were coming at a time and debating with friends and talking about it, right? Over the years and kind of like, I want to die at zero and like whatever. And then them challenging me and then me thinking about it and answering back. And these foundational concepts and experiences in my life kind of brought about this whole body of work, this whole message. Now, the funny thing is, is that when I started writing this book, right? And going in to talk about it, I was like, there's no books on this, whatever, blah, blah, blah. But there were two Italians who wrote uh, Life Cycle Theory, right? Mm -hmm. They won the Nobel Prize for it, which is similar, which basically says a person, a rational person looking to get the most out of life, you know, will will, will end with zero dollars. And it talks about income smoothing and those things out of it, right? Which Joe Farrell was talking about income smoothing, right? In, in, in New York trader speak, right? You're a fucking idiot. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> right? And, it, and it's this very technical paper, right? But I was coming to it in a, in a very more, a more natural way, in a way that I think humans are better to learn and absorb the information, right? I was having experiential learning in, in spots along my life. And then I was synthesizing it together. So my book isn't written like an economist paper, right? <laughs> With, you know, this tactical and we looked and we solved for volatility and blah, blah, blah. You know, it's, it's like, here are the stories and things in my life and the reasons why this applies. And here's the mental model you can use, right? Without having a spreadsheet, without having anything to get, have a, the most fulfilling life you possibly can. I wonder this experience of realization that time is money, basically, because what you described of, oh, this shirt is two hours of my life. You know, it's not X amount of dollars. It's actually a number of hours. Everything can be translated to hours. So money is time. Time is money. Did that change the way, did that change your productivity? It, 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 it didn't change. What it changed is my goal set and the way I thought about things. And, and so like people have said that before my entire life. Right. Like people said, money is time. Time is money are going. Of course. Yeah, I agree. Time is money. Money is time. Um, but until I went through that painstaking process, that fucking writing down every fucking cent you had, adding it in, subtracting the dollars and truly calculating my true hourly wage. Mm -hmm. Right. What it cost me to go to work. Right. Including all the time it took me to go to work because there was transportation to and from work. Right. That I had to get there. That was unavoidable. Um, the money I received after tax, dividing it all out by the hours and coming up with the true number, right? And getting there, it didn't sink in. It was just a slogan, right? It's just a fucking platitude. Time is money, you know, a bromide, whatever. That's trite. Thank you. Mm. <laughs> you know, eat a bag of dicks. Who doesn't know that? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> so, so, but once I did that, it was like, holy fuck, I'm fucking away my life for this bullshit, right? Like, you know, things that I would just be like, oh, it's only $17 or it's only whatever. It's like, holy shit, I'm going to spend five hours on my feet doing hand signals in the fucking pit for this dumb thing? Like, I, I, am I a fucking idiot? Like, well, what am I doing? I'm wasting my life, right? So that's the first thing that kind of hit me. And it started, it, my priorities changed real fast, mm -hmm. right? I started to be like, these are the things I really want. But the second thing I realized is that I want to lever my time. I want one hour of my life to get 10 hours of yours. Right? <laughs> and so I started really thinking about leverage, right? Like, how can I lever my time? Right? And so 
I, I, you know, your money, your life is all about being in touch with what you really want, right? And frugality came out of that and getting rid of clutter and bullshit and not wasting your, really understanding your priorities and how you, what do you want to change hours of your life for, which is great. But I went the other way. I went with like, oh, here's the system of how the whole world is working. We're all exchanging hours of, my time, of our time. But this guy gives me an hour and I got to give him back 60, 70, 100, 1,000 hours, right? Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it's, it's not one for one, but it's, the, you know, some total, right? So I want one hour of mine to be three hours of that doctor, five hours out of this, the pilots on the plane, the blah, 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 the blah, 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 and the blah, 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 right? And so I began to focus on ways to leverage. So I went evil in a way, right? I went, I went like, great, got it? I want, I want, I want one hour to eat a thousand of somebody else's hours or 10,000, right? I, I was like, how can I get the maximum amount of hours, right? Forget the money. I just want the maximum hours. If, if there was no such thing as money, I was just like, okay, can I have, um, can I have 300 million people hours, you know, <laughs> of whoever, you know? That, 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 that's the way I, I began to think about it. And so um, I really love commodities and I really look for levered spots, you know? And, and, and I look for risky levered spots, right? Because I always knew I can go to one for one wage, right? Like you work an hour to give you 16 bucks or 20 bucks or whatever the wage is, 15 bucks, $10 an hour, depending on what, what year it is, what town you're in, whatever. But with leverage, right? I can get... I can get the hours I wanted to have the experiences I wanted, right? Because I want the experience of being able to go to a doctor and, and want to get my teeth cleaned. And I want, to, I want to fly on a plane. So I need the hours of the pilots and the planes and the ticket maker and Boeing workers who built the fucking thing, you know? Right? That's all hidden when you just put this abstract called money together, right? It's just money. Right, right. It's money, money. But really, we're exchanging hours, life energy, back and forth, right? Mm. That's that a beautiful, of- beautiful way to look at it. <laughs> yeah. It's... I, hi- I can't recommend your money or your life in those exercises. And it's pretty painful to go through uh, because it's, it's a lot of detail. It's painstaking. And the book is didactic. I mean, it's, but it's trying to hammer in a point that's very important. And, and I think it couldn't be written any other way. Right. And so I forgot where we were originally going with this, but <laughs> the, 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 that moment in my life of, time and money and then realizing what did I wanted to do with time, right? Because most people want to live forever, right? Healthy live forever, right? We can't do that. But what we can do is get a lot of hours, hmm. right? I can get a lot of hours, right? So if I, 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 if, you know, when you're levered, it's like, wow, I can get three, you know, I, you, most, I think, what, what do people normally live, uh, 40, 50,000 days, right? 40,000 days, 50,000 days. But when you're levered, you get the use of 3 million days. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, or whatever, whatever you, whatever you can get to, right? Mm. And, and then you need to use them, right? If you get 3 million days and you don't use them, well, you just wasted life. Like, why the hell did you do that? You know, mm. you know what I'm saying? And so that's, that's kind of like when you break it down simply and take all the abstract of money, because the money itself is confusing. Abstracts kind of, it's like at a casino, right? You go in, they give you chips and you're like, oh, it was only two chips and the chips go back and forth. If that was cash, people would behave totally different. They wouldn't be so flippant with the money on the tables, mm-hmm. right? Uh, um, and so when you take the abstract of money away and you start thinking about hours of your life, you won't be as flippant either. The, the dollars we hand around or like casino chips, and it gets people to be flippant with it and fucking be like, oh, I'm going to work, you know, five days for this fucking shirt because I'm going to put it on my credit card and they're going to charge me interest and blah, blah, blah. I'm going to be paying that and I'm going to be working to pay that down for the rest of my goddamn life. And that's going to work out to be five days for this goddamn shirt when it's all done. And then it's five days for this. And people, you know, if it was like, you started telling people like that, oh, five days of your life, 10 hours of your life, 24 hours for this three hours for that. People would be like, no, 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 no. I don't want to give up my life for that. No, 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 no. I'm not going to do that. But you give them casino chips or our casino chips, which are dollars. They're like, let it ride. What are we going to do? Here's a $50 tip. You know what I mean? Like, you know, like they, they start, they're big timing, you know? 
Oh, wow. You know, there, there are so many things I want to kind of zoom in around this, what you're yeah. saying. Because one, one of the things is also, which struck me as very powerful, you know, when the concepts you talk like, um, what was it, time bucketing, yes. right? And the utility of money, personal interest, all these things basically all boil down to the value of money is different depending on the stage of your life. The, the older you get, you know, the, the more your health, and also an important concept of not only your um, like chronological age, but, but your biological. Actual biological age, right? Because so yeah. many of us sort of kill ourselves slowly by working these crazy hours. You know, by the time you're 35, by the time you're 40, you're burned out, you're no longer able to enjoy all these experiences that you were craving and thinking like, oh, I'm going to get, you know, and then you look at some 70 year old still enjoying kite surfing and stuff. And you're like, okay, can't do that. Everything hurts. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful way that how, how you put it. And at the same time, I feel like people, a lot of people have a problem of figuring out what it is that they want to do. That is the hardest part. Um, I was talking about this, that, you know, a lot of things that you want up until age, let's say 21, could be earlier or later, depending on your, it's just culture. It's not your dream. It's a dream of others passed down to you. Like when you're going to get married, when do you think about marriage, the food you eat, you know what I mean? The team you root for, the place you live, it's the dream of others. You know what I mean? It's not your dreams. You didn't really want that. You just got inculcated, right? Out of habit to, to like this and like that and want this and want to get married and the Disney movie you watch and the culture, all the stuff you absorbed, right? And you fly to some place, they have different dreams, different culture, right? You know, and people are different, right? But as soon as you start to be independent and when you're not on autopilot hustling, trying to make money or whatever and doing all these other habits, right? That help you survive, right? And you, and you sit back, you're like, wow, what do I, what do I really want? What do I really like? What do I want out of life? What experiences? And, and, and that is probably the most difficult thing that people need to do and, and pay attention to is that identifying the things they want out of life and when, right? And so the exercise time bucketing is like, look, you're going to die. Period, end of sentence, let's wake up to that fact. Not only are you going to die, you're going to deteriorate, okay? Let's just wake up to that fact. You will deteriorate. At what rate is up to you? right? Whether you're staying healthy, the foods you eat, whether you get enough sleep, whether you do four hours of exercise and all the other tricks and things you should be doing, right? According to doctors and studies and, and numerous empirical data, right? And so, you know, understanding that rate of your deterioration, understanding you're going to die, and then also understanding periods of your life are going to die. The single you is going to die, Right? The you with small kids is going to die. They're going to get older. The you as an empty, you know, you with kids in the house, they, they leave the flu, fly the coop and then whatever, right? You as a first time worker, you as X, Y, and Z. These periods, they die. And there are certain experiences that are meant only for that period. Some can transfer, you know, from bucket to bucket. For some are, you do them before that period dies or you never do them, right? Mm. Right now, the ultimate the ultimate arbiter on a lot of experiences is your biological age and your health. Right, I'm not playing football. I cannot. My spine cannot take it. I have to play cartilage. My whatever, it's done. The memories of playing football are greater than me playing football now. Like I could go play it, but it's gonna suck. I get zero experience points. I get negative. I'm gonna be like I I could die. You know what I mean? <laughs> that type of thing. <laughs> you know. So 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 people need to realize this and not in a morbid way, but in a liberating way, right? It allows you to go, wow, you're right. I, I, I this is going to die. And these are the things I want to have happen in this period. And I'm going to work and make sure they happen. I'm not going to be autopilot. Let it pass me and be like, Oh fuck. Why didn't I do this when I was in college? Or why did I do this in my twenties? Or I wish I did this when, or whatever, blah, blah, blah. And you know, if, if you do that time bucketed, then when you get to the end of your life, you're going to have zero, zero regrets. You're going to die with zero regrets. Now, not zero, but as close to zero as possible, right? Hmm. Because you will have optimized each period of your life all the way down. 
right? You won't be delaying gratification to when you're 65, get to 65 and realize, shit, I don't like this or I can't do it or I can do it, but it's painful, right? You'll get to 65 and be like, I'm glad I took that trip back in the Himalayas and I hiked Machu Picchu and I went with the guy and the thing and I met the guy and we did this and that. We drank ayahuasca and we had the experience, whatever, and blah, blah, blah. And you tell a story and you have an adventure. Not, fuck, I wish I did that or I wish I could do that now, right? And you just have a fuller life, you know? I'm glad I went and visited grandma. I'm glad I took my parents on this trip. I'm glad I did, whatever it is, right? Like, don't use the examples I'm saying as the blueprint for your life right? Or the blueprint of the things you should be doing. I'm just throwing out examples that may fit me. But for each person, they're going to be different. The point is, is identify them, get off autopilot, get off culture autopilot, take the time and to time bucket your life, put them in there so that you can optimize. Yeah. And, and what you just were describing, I think in the book, you, you said something along the line, you retire um, you retire on your memories. Correct. Right? You retire on your memories, not on money. Exactly. And, and also another thing you, you said was your life is the sum of your experiences, which is, Correct. Which is a beautiful idea, right? Because it's, it's definitely not the sum of the shit you bought. You know, it's no. not the sum of all the cars you own and none of that matters no. really. I mean, that's an experience itself, but it's a minor experience. It's the sum of your choices and the sum of experiences you've had. Like some people is like, oh, I don't think my life is the sum of experiences. I'm like, yeah, yeah you, you, they were thinking more like hedonistically, like vacations and travels. But it's also some of the experiences of you helping people. Like some of the most joy and things pride in my head. I'm like a private, I don't like to go brag and say, I did this or I helped that or I solved this problem. Sometimes I do it publicly to try and send a signal to other people. Like this was a worthy cause. Please join me and help it. Mm -hmm. But those are experiences too. The experiences of giving, the experiences of helping people, the experiences of saying I love you, the experiences of helping my daughter with homework at night, right? I had, a, I had, a, I had an issue. Like I have a, a, a health bet. I have to work out and I'm going to be really tired. It was, it was a Peloton day and I was like, I can't do it on the next day because my legs will be too tired, right? Because then I only have four days or whatever. But then my daughter was like struggling with uh, pre-calculus. I'm like, fuck, I got to go relearn pre-calculus and help my daughter. I get to do this. I, I'm not going to have this moment anytime and I'm, I'm choosing that's another experience right mm -hmm. and my life is the sum of the experiences just like that not just i went to the club and i met this babe and we had sex and blah 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 you know what i mean like those are experiences too right but it's not just hedonistic experiences it's the sum total of your choices mm -hmm. and i mean everything is an experience like buying something yes. is an experience in itself you know you might remember the first time you bought a car and the whole yes. process of it yeah it, it, mm -hmm. it could be and also this this beautiful concept of memory dividends which yes. is basically that over time the memories become more and more valuable because obviously we remember the good stuff mostly hopefully you know hopefully people don't dwell too much on the bad stuff everybody gets has some bad stuff as well that they could dwell on, but hopefully the good stuff, and you remember it better and but like in a brighter light every time you look at it, because it's well, always I, becoming more and more positive. I, I think that's possible and some memories fades, but the, the idea is, is this, is that you ask anybody who hit a game winning home run or had a great poker play and won a big pot or won a tournament, how many fucking times did they tell that story for their life? Thousands. Right. And every time they do that, that's an experience telling in a story of what happened. And when you tell that story and you recall it, you get a little bit of the endorphins, the same situations and relive it. Right. And that's a dividend. You get a piece of that. So while you may only hit the game winning home one once. Right. You'll relive that thousands of times. Right. So even if it's only one percent of enjoyment or reliving it and telling it. OK. It's going to add up to more than the hundred, you know, more, more than the original experience, right? The memory dividends, when you put money in a bank, right? You can only withdraw so much before you're out of money. You put an experience or memory in the bank, you can withdraw infinitely. And it also compounds, right? Like I'm sitting here telling you stories about Joe Farrell calling me a fucking idiot and my transformation, et cetera, right? This is an experience. Other people are going to get it. It's radioactive. It compounds, right? So some experiences compound. They form new relationships. They form, they form, they form ideas. They spur the exchange of ideas, et cetera. And then that, it creates its own new experience, right? A lot of times that, you know, my new best friends 
that I've made, right? We didn't just sit there and start from scratch, right? We talked to each other. We talked about things we did and we found something in common, whatever. Had we done nothing, like, well, you know, why am I hanging out with you? You're male and you have a penis. I like women, whatever. You know what I mean? Like, but we, we had all these experiences and we enjoyed each other's company, right? And that fostered a relationship and created this new great thing, right? And so, you know, memory dividends is extremely important um, because it helps you do the mental calculus on when, what you should do now and what you should do later, right? A lot of people just leave that out. Like, oh, I'll wait until I'm 50 and then I'll do it and I'll have a bigger trip or a better thing, right? But maybe doing the trip now a little smaller with the memory dividends and all the stuff that kicks out of it is a better plan. Yeah, because like in the book, you've mentioned this this trip that your friend made. Uh, Jason Rufo, yeah. Yeah, he even borrowed from a loan shark. Definitely ill-advised. <laughs> Don't do I that at like, home. I was like, you are fucking nuts doing this. <laughs> I was yeah. like, you are out of your mind. And then, after, and then you know, as time goes on and after the trip, I, I've, I've been like, wow, he did it right. Mm. He 100% did it right. He borrowed from his future richer self. He paid a ridiculous interest rate and he has an irreplaceable experience mm. forever for the rest of his life. And he did it in a time bucket that it was meant for. He can't be, he can't be properly done as a 35 year old or 30 year old when he's richer. Right. Yeah. Cause like and I was just like, book, you're not going to be staying in these student hotels, you know, it's just, uh... no, no, it's not, a, it's not only, it's not only like you're, 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 you know, there's, there's, there's your, 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 you know, there's a hard dynamic choices that get in the way, right? You have kids or whatever. And, and so, you know, life is like uh, Tetris, right? You, you got to get the order right or you don't get the high score, mm-hmm. right? You don't have kids at 16 or whatever. And then, you know, I'm going to go hike my Everest. No, you got to do Everest before you have kids or after they get out of the house. And if you're too old to hike Everest when they're out of the house, then you never hike Everest. So you don't get the highest high score in your life, right? I'm, I'm kind of Monte Carloing one life, right? We can't do that, but I'm thought experimenting Monte Carlo in a life, right? And that's kind of what the model of the program does, right? Like mm-hmm. we had an avatar and this was a Sims thing. Like, oh, should John have kids now or later? Should he, he wants, these are the things he wants to do. Here's all the things this guy wants out of his life. Let's order them right so he can get them. Then you do play one game, you order them wrong and you don't get to do them all, right? And then you finally get the order right. You get the high score, right? This is what this book is about, right? And it's what you want, not what I want. And, you know, Jason did that properly at the right time, you know, which seemed far. I I looked at him like he had three heads. I thought he was psycho. And now I was like, intuitively, he had it right. Right. He didn't read some economist paper on life cycle theory. He didn't have my book as a guideline. He didn't think he just intuitively got it. Right. And it and, and it took him doing it. And my interaction is seeing, and that was another one of the puzzles in the detective story of like this, this philosophy, this message, right? Mm-hmm. Getting it across, you know, another example. Yeah, and part of the message there is also the risk and reward, which you've mentioned. And obviously, earlier stages in your life, the risk is always kind of small. You, know, you yeah. want to figure out if you like that career, if you want to do that, you know, if you want to be a professional poker player. Well, guess what? If you're 20 something, Go ahead and try. What's the worst thing that's going to happen? Yeah. I mean, it, it's it, it, risk taking is probably one of the things. I mean, people are extremely risk averse. And I understand that they have fears. And, and I think the main thing is just fear of failure. You know, I think most of the times I didn't take a risk was not even fear of failure. It was like I wasn't even really worried about, like, am I going to eat or whatever. I was worried about what other people are going to think and would that affect my future prospects, mm. right? That fear of failure, the fear of looking like an idiot. So you got to be willing to look like an idiot and, and, and try some things and go back because it, it doesn't, it really doesn't fucking matter. <laughs> you know, look at Dick Cheney, look at Obama, look at all these people, right? Like you go to the, like, look what they were doing. It's like, this guy's going to be president. This guy's going to be vice. What? Huh? You know what I mean? Like, you know, like, 
so you, you can you can really hit the ground and scuff it up, uh, you know, and, and when you're young, it's so much easier to get up and you have so much time to get up. And when you get up, you have so much experience. The experience of doing something the wrong way is a valuable thing. Hmm. That's how children learn, right? Like, stick the thing in the socket. No, don't do that. <laughs> Touch the hot stove. Ow, don't do that, <laughs> right? Like, singles, you know, like, all right, that's not the way to do it, you know? <laughs> You know, it's, it's the Edisonian approach, right? Like Thomas Edison, it's not, wasn't like he was like a genius. He was like, oh, it's this filament. No, he tried a thousand filaments plus until he got the counting month upon the right filament that worked for the light bulb, right? And so that, that's why we call it the Edisonian method. Like just keep fucking trying, you know? Mm. Right? That's what these computers do, right? Like <laughs> they play each other 18 gajillion times until they have the optimal move and then they keep building on that or whatever, right? Like that, that is a method to do it. So like you, but when you have an experience or you go take a risk, you get a lot of learning and a lot of fun and a full adventurous life, you know? Mm-hmm. You just got to overcome that fear. Yeah. And, and fear also of, as you said, what others are going to be thinking about me? Because it always is a big influencer, especially for younger people, right? And as you said, like the, the young guys, the, the kids and, and the people in their early 20s, it would be, you basically are influenced by culture so much. You think you want to do something because it's the thing that people do. Yeah. Whereas to arrive at knowing what you actually do, you have to try so many things, but it's pretty hard because you have a job to do. You have a nine to five or you have more than that. You know, and you, you're always in this kind of rat race and it's, it's hard to get out. So it's I, hard I, to, yeah. <laughs> no, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I get you. Um, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, I, I get you, but you have to take the time and say, what aspects of culture do I agree with and I like that I would come to on myself? I want to stay in this, this path. What, what do I really want? Where do I really want to live? I, you know, the, one of the things I find so funny is how much people's place where they live, who they married, is based on other people's prior decisions. It's where my mom lives. It's where my best friend lives. This is where my so-and-so friend lives. So I'm going to live here and I have to get a job here. So I have to go on this career path. That great fucking great job over in Florida or whatever, or a great job over in so I'm not even going to apply. I'm not even going to think about it. I won't even look at them. I will be aware. I will put on blinders and I won't even do this, right? I'm going to do this my whole life because I grew up in Jersey City and I'd be here. And these are all the people I know. And I don't want to make new friends and I don't want to have to travel back and forth, right? Without actually thinking it through. I'm not saying that's the wrong decision, but I'm saying it can't be the right decision if you're not taking in all the information. Mm. That's why like there's, you know, you're like all these job postings and the unemployment is like this. A lot of that's because people won't move. Now we're starting to go to remote work. And a lot of certain positions are remote and you can move, you know what I mean? You can remote. So that's going to start changing, right? A little bit. But a lot of the people won't move. And every time I hear, I, you know, I, there's always going to be something like there's people who can't move. I get it, right? Like for whatever reasons. And then that's their choice. Actually, they can, but they have higher priorities that keep them from moving, right? But a lot of it is, is people will not move. They will not take the risk of moving. They will not go here. They will not go there. And all the opportunities, all the wonderful opportunities in a nation as big as this, 50 states, 330 million Americans, thousands of small businesses, businesses, startups, or whatever, are unavailable to them because they won't even consider moving and they don't even look because they won't take that risk. They won't take it. And that's, that's a different type of risk. That's an emotional risk. Right? People are risk averse. And you can choose to be risk averse. I'm not saying you have to. I'm just saying at least weigh it out. At least get off autopilot and weigh it out. Right? I'm not saying it's better. It may not be better for you. It may not be like, no, I I like staying here and blah, blah, blah. But just realize that your life is being chosen for you by your own mind, by your own walls that were set up by the culture. And I, I, I was like, for whatever reason, maybe because I didn't get along with some people in my family, or maybe because I, I was a uh, class, or maybe because I, I, you know, 
I got the fuck you gene. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or I want to do something different. I was like, I'll fucking go anywhere. I'll go live in Siberia if I want to go trade. I, once I got attached to leverage, I was like, I will go anywhere the opportunity is. I don't care. Hmm. That's unimportant to me. The goal is more important, right? Once I make enough money, I can fly back and forth. You know what I mean? I spent more times with certain friends when I moved out of the city than I did. You know, because I fly back, I'd stay in a nicer place. The money I saved moving out of New York City, I had all this other money to do other things. I could fly back, stay in a nice hotel, spend a whole week with them, do whatever, blah, blah, blah. I saw more of the city as a tourist than I would live there. Because all I did was get on the two and three train, go down to World Trade Center, do my work, go back up the two and three train and hang out maybe in Central Park, rollerblade on Sunday, and that was it. If you took my cell phone out and mapped it, right? When I finally got a cell phone, right? When you, if you map that goddamn thing, you'd be like, wow, his whole life is this skinny ass thing. And New York City is this big, wonderful place. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like Disney World, you know? You can't ride all the rides, but you pay for it. So, so <laughs> right? All you, eat, all you can eat buffet type thing, right? So anyway, I mean, we're, I'm just harping and ranting on, on, on a type of risk that people don't take, right? Some people don't take the risk of saying, I love you first. Real, truly expressing their feelings, you know, laying it out on the line, missing out on a potentially wonderful, wonderful relationship for the fear of rejection. I can't, I can't take, take, take a no. I can't take the rejection. Could have been the best romance that ever was, you know? So I, I always encourage people to like, hey, think of the maximum risk you can take and just add a little bit more. Live your life that way. I think it's going to be the most fulfilling life. That's my two cents on it. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. And, and also, I want to circle back to what you were talking about, the moving and at least weighing all the options. I really liked um, in the book you've mentioned comparing two jobs. You know, one is a more high, higher paid job than the other. Doesn't mean you're actually getting more money. No, because if you don't consider the whole picture, very often you can get fooled by. And I know several of my friends, and I was looking at them making these these decisions, like in a proper career, you know, just moving up the ladder somewhere, switching the company because of this, this, this. Eventually, it boils down because I get twenty percent more salary. I'm like, dude, really? You're gonna tr you're gonna uh, commute to work extra two hours every day of your life, you know? Plus that, plus that, plus that. So count the expenses and count how much time you're going to have left on your hands. What are you going to do with this tiny bit of extra money that you made and less time to use it? Yeah, the, the, there, is a very, that, there is a very detailed examples of that, several in a didactic manner, in that your hourly wage is actually lower. So when you start doing that exercise about total revenue in, total time on the job, plus expense of the job, right? And that expense may include, to have this job, I have to live closer in the city, or I have to live here. And the rent is $2,000 a month more expensive, or $1,000 a month more expensive. So that's $12,000 that I'm spending that I wouldn't have to spend if I took this job, right? You have to calculate all that. And it turns out, it's like, oh yeah, that's a nice fancy title, and all this other shit, but that job I'm making $20 an hour, and this job I'm making $30 an hour. You know what I mean? And so you gotta go through that exercise. You know what I mean? <laughs> you gotta go through that exercise. And, 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 and to equilibrate for the same amount of money, right, you gotta work 50% more. So where's the time to spend the money to do the experiences you wanna have, which you're astutely pointing out. Right. Mm. You know what I mean? Like it, it, it's, and so people are, are autopiloting, autopiloting many parts of their life instead of diagramming and modeling them. Right. And this book is about modeling your life. It's a life optimization book about from wherever you are now to the grave, to the day you die and modeling it. And if you model, you're going to optimize, you're going to get close to optimize. You're going to have less waste. You're going to have a more fulfilling life. If you don't, you're going to be autopilot and it's going to be fuckery and you're going to be wasting lots of your life. There's no two ways about it, right? Goals are great. I want to make a million dollars. I want to do that. That's great. But why? What for? What experience are you going to have? And when are you going to have them? Without the modeling, it's just fuckery. It, it's, it's puffery. 
right? Like I'm working right now in trading. I'm like, okay, I may make this money and probably I'm putting in this time and I'm running this fund, but what is the thing that I want when I make the money? What impact am I trying to have? What experience am I trying, you know, what experience am I trying to have with this money? And is it worth the hours of my life that I'm out there? And I have to really think about that sometimes because I myself, I wrote the damn book, but it's really fucking hard to get off autopilot. So I have to, what the fuck are you doing, Bill Perkins? You know what I mean? You know, and sit down, you know, Larry and I have to sit down. I was like, okay, you want to have kids. When, when's the date? When we're going to have that? When, whatever, let's model this out. Right. I mean, yeah, there's going to be some potluck in your life, right? Life is discovery. You, you, a lot of life is discovering what you want, right? You don't know. You have to get out there and do shit to figure out what you want. You have the information has to be transmitted to you. Right. Uh, and I'm saying above and beyond survival. We all want to survive. So I know some people are like, I want to eat. No one. Survival is the base. And then after that, right? So most of us, um, you know, after you feed, clothe, and, and, and feed and clothe yourself and have shelter, you know, you're operating on a want basis, right? And so I'm trying to identify the things I want and not be on autopilot. Like, oh, it's an extra whatever dollar amount, X dollars. Who gives a fuck? What do those dollars represent? What experiences do they represent? Or are you just wasting your time chasing shit that you're like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm just going to give it here. You know what I mean? Like, you know, go, go play poker with it and gamble just to have fun for the thrill of, of being the underdog and coming back. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like something stupid, right? Like stop, don't waste my life. And so I, I am like goal setting is nice. It's out, but modeling is in. That is it. That is what this book is about, getting off autopilot and modeling. And so when people model decisions like you're talking about, like I take this job or a step, which is in detail talked about in Your Money, Your Life. And I, know I wrote a book, Die With Zero, but Your Money, Your Life is such a great book. I have to, I have to give it credit when credit is due. Um, that was one of the foundations. Like, oh, model this, model that, break it down, think about it, put it in simple things and terms. And then you'll be able to, then you have a, what is the greatest invention of mankind? The equal sign. Because then you can go, let's put up the equal, let's put it on the, on the scale and see that these balance. And you're like, no, there's an inequality, put the whatever. Like, that is the greatest thing man has ever invented. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you can make these comparisons because human beings are relative engines. We suck at absolutes, right? I know my speed relative to other things. I don't know what a pencil should cost, but because I know what this costs and that costs, I have an idea what a pencil could cost. You know what I mean? I don't know what this glass of wine should cost, but I know this. I don't know how much a hot dog should cost, but I know how much this, this burger costs and a hot dog can't be 30X that or 10X. It should be right around, you know, this. It's this many calories. You know, a meal is roughly, a meal is roughly 300 to 600 calories. Then I know relatively blah, blah, blah. So I can break it down, right? So... I know what an expensive meal is because I know a meal is 300 to 600 calories. I look at anything as, is, 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 let's call it 500 calories and you know, it should cost this much. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, so, so we're relative difference engines and the equal sign helps you compare things. Hmm. That's a beautiful way to look at it. Do you know what? I want to ask you about breaking or, you know, switching off the autopilot. Because we've been talking about the autopilot, how it stops people from, you know, changing simple things like, well, it's not a simple thing, but like moving somewhere for a different job, considering other options, you know, breaking out of this rat race, mm -hmm. breaking, you know, taking a step away from that wheel. So from your own life, what was the, like, some of the first experiences that you had where sort of a switch came on and you realized, you know what, I want to do more of this and this is why I'm working for things like this, for days like this, for memories like this, for experiences like this. What was the first thing for you where it like an aha moment where you realized, you know what, this is it. You, you know, the funny thing, I, I, I don't know if this is it, but I'm, I'm going to tell a story back in college. There's a guy named Dwight Sistrunk, right? He was, he was kind of bad. He, he was from, you know, uh, like a poor economic background, excellent football player, heat-seeking missile. He's got into some bad stuff or whatever. But I remember one time we were just having an argument. He's like, 
I don't want to fucking do that. I want a two picket house, blah, 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 blah. That's not, this shit's not for me. You guys can go live that cookie cutter life, blah, 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 whatever. And, it, and it, if, you know, he did this little tirade, not exactly that way. And it, and it fucking hit me. I was like, I'll never forget when he said those words. I should probably call him up and, and be like, Dwight, you know what? You know, we had our battles, blah, 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 in college, whatever. But like, this really had a huge impact on me because I was like, fuck, is that what I want? What, 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 could, what else is there but the picket fence and the job and the promotion every year and blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? Like, it was like, how could he not want that? <laughs> Why aren't we, here, aren't we here in college for that? You know what I mean? Like, I was such in a fucking bubble of, of, of culture and, and what my life was going to be that I couldn't even consider around it. And he, he was the first one that like kind of cracked, you know, was banging on the glass and putting the cracks up to get me to start thinking. It's like, yeah, why do I want that? That does seem monotonous and boring to me. You know what I mean? Well, this part I like, but that part I don't. And, and it has stuck with me for 30 something years. You know, that first crack. You know, and then it led to me thinking about like, why did I think I want this in the first place? You know, and also there's other thinkers about this. There's other ways to come across this realization, right? The Matrix is a great like little movie that gets you thinking about things like that, right? Like, and, and other books and people talk about the dream of culture, right? Like, why was it acceptable? Like, when we look back to the 60s and civil rights eras right now, like, we're like, how could that fucking be, right? But when you look at the surveys at the time and what they thought about the movements or whatever, it was like, that was the culture. It's the way it's been. That's the way it is. It's very hard to get out of your culture. It's very hard. Why did good white people allow this thing called slavery, the, the, the rape and the beatings and runaways being caught and a police force to catch them? Like, how the fuck did that exist in America? Right? It's just hard to escape. You get this programming, right? Because you're born and you're a supercomputer, right? You're this baby supercomputer, but they program you for 12 years to 14 years until you can kind of make it on your own. Humans need like 12 years of programming to 14 years before they can be like, fucking, I'm out in the wild. Like I can, I don't need anybody. I can fucking hunt for myself and kill the bear or kill the whatever. I can do traps. I can fish, whatever. I'm on my own, but you're programmed. Nonetheless, right? And in a society, you're programmed to society's rules and norms, right? And they're with you, right? So I'm programmed to operate in a, this environment with financial leverage and financial tools and blah, blah, blah. And I am a fucking master, right? <laughs> of doing that because I've been programmed to operate in this environment, right? And I've been programmed with other things, cultural equality, you know, uh, uh, you know, respect for other people's thoughts and, and opinions and lifestyles and freedom and blah, blah, blah. But I got that programming, you know, and some of the programming I got was bad. It was bad programming and I had to reprogram myself. It took some external force to reprogram me. You know, my views on certain social subjects have drastically changed from when I was younger. You know, it's like, what the fuck was I thinking? <laughs> you know, <laughs> Where did, how could I, what? How could I have been that fucking dumb? You know, the cognitive dissonance of some of my opinions is staggering when I look backwards, you know? And so this programming is good because it allows you to operate in the world you're in, right? But there's also a lot of bad programming that goes in there, right? And then you get to a stage where you start to write your own programs, but you got to be willing to break the routine. Right? You got to be willing to break the routine. And what I think, this is just my theory, we create habits in order to survive. Right? So in this society, we got to get the job, you got to get the money, you got to get whatever, we take out the loans, you got to have social things, we, we got to get, we, we desire meat, we got to, we, so we got to behave this way and do that way and being this so circle over and behave this way or whatever, according to our programming, right? And so we're on these habits that are autopilot and they serve us well because they, they, they keep us alive, right? But they're constantly running and you got to break them and think, okay, is this a good one? Is this really what I want? Or have I just habituated myself, right? 
It's why you get a guy and he's like working at a job 20 years or whatever, he quits. He doesn't know what to do because he's completely detached himself from what he really wanted when he was a kid on the things he wanted. He's been on habit to survive and it became the thing. He's become a hamster in a wheel with no cheese. He used to run for the cheese. Now he just runs every time he sees the wheel, right? It was great because I got a kid through school and it did the bill, bought the house and the thing and whatever, but it's also bad because he doesn't break the habits. He has to create other habits to focus on the things he wants, small steps, you know, to disassociate the two. Hmm. You know, like you're a poker player, right? You exploit other people's habits. You find a node on the three bet pot in this texture, this guy overfolds, whatever. So you exploit the fuck out of that because he has this bad habit, right? When you have bad habits and when you have these habits in life, you exploit the fuck out of yourself. You know, life, you just exploit the fuck out of yourself, right? And so you got to get out and, 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 and break habits and try and find the habits that are not pushing you towards the goals and the things you want and take tiny steps to form new habits. And so mine is, my, book, my message is a overall optimization, right? It's a life optimization, life model, right? It gives you a mental model. But like we're diving down into a silo. Like why are people this way? Why do they do this, right? And there's a book called Tiny Habits uh, by BJ Fogg on behavior design. Fantastic book. I actually took the boot camp on behavior design. And it's about designing behavior, your own or other people's, and how to behavior design. And that's a hack on how to like, okay, look, this is a good way to get all autopilot and, and have habits that get to me to my goals, whatever they are. This is how you do it. But that is, if I, if I uh, had to say, what is the hardest part in my book? Like what is the hardest thing to implement in my book is, is, breaking those habits and creating new ones towards the goals you want and identifying, getting back in touch with yourself about the things you really want in life. Why am I really doing this? This is really what I want. If nobody cared and I wasn't worried about anybody's action and I could snap people's fingers, whatever, and they would forget everything I did, what life would I live? What would I really do? You know? I wasn't worried about what my mom thinks or my spouse thinks or my kids think, you know, or there was no risk of failure, no risk of whatever. What would I really do? And then, you know, work backwards. Okay. There's some risk of failure, but do I still want to do it? Blah, blah, blah. You know, these are questions. You know, I always say like, um, my friend's like, Oh, you're going to, you're going to do mushrooms, whatever. Like, yeah. I want to discover the questions. It's not the answers I want to discover. I want to discover what questions do I need to be asking of myself? But there's a list of questions that are out there and other books and other people talking about. You need to be asking yourself. A lot of times, way more than once. Because the answer is not going to come to you right away. You know, it's sometimes, sometimes it does. It's great. You're in the shower and you're like, Eureka, right? But more likely, it's like you're fucking wrestling with this thing in your sleep. You're going to sleep. It's like a demon that you got to wrestle with and beat. And then finally, the answer yields itself. Or you'll, you'll be wrestling with the question, the question's with you, and you'll see something. You'll see it in somebody else's life or your life or some example, and you're like, God damn it, I found it. But because you were answering the question, you see the answer. Yeah, because you're, I mean, unless you're focused on something, you're not gonna, right. you're just gonna miss it. Correct. The answers are all around us, they're everywhere. But you got to ask the question because you'd be overwhelmed. Right? Just answer, 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 answer. But you gotta, what's the question? You know, first question, what do I want? Mm. Why am I doing these things? And you know what? That reminds me, this and the, the previous, uh, you know, the previous thing that we were discussing reminds me of the story that you talk about in the book of your friend who, who's been in that rat race, making a lot of money, right. just constantly working, 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 and then... You tell them, well, listen, buddy, your, your life is about experiences. Go have the experiences already. You know, don't wait till yeah. you're 65. Go, go ex enjoy the life. And he's basically saying something along the lines of, well, I don't have uh, an expensive taste. I don't need expensive restaurants. <laughs> I don't need to travel. Don't... And it, the question is like, how do you know? You never exactly. try. How do you know? How do you, you know? 
and and for me it was such an interesting um sort of story because because also i i noticed in the book you've you've mentioned two beautiful islands like the sun barts and and the other one which was um one of the caribbeans what was it the uh, van dyke something Jos van dyke uh, right that one with the soggy soggy, soggy dollar dollar bar, bar, yeah right so you're talking about two beautiful islands in the caribbean the experience of the soggy dollar bar you know your 45th birthday bash just incredible stuff, incredible right. experiences. But it's not about the money. No. Other people who can afford it don't even think about having those experiences. Yeah. Listen, everywhere I go, everywhere I go, there's somebody with no money there <laughs> enjoying it just as fun. They're on a paddle board, and they're paddling out, and they're standing up paddling board, and they're fucking loving life, you know? <laughs> right? Doing the same thing. I went to Thailand. People were happier than me. They're li- living life. There's, there's people, uh, Matt, um, Matt Forsyth from the Thirst Lounge. Guy lives in his car traveling the country. I, you know, I don't know how many times I told him I'm envious of his life. Hmm. I'm, like, I'm like, you're doing life right, dude. You're having all these fucking rich experiences. You, you, you're, it's amazing. You know, I sent him on a coin flip trip. Low budget. They flip a coin. Part of the experiment was like, if you flip a coin, you, 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 you flip high, you get, I don't know, whatever it was. I'm, I, I'm probably getting the numbers wrong, but $500 per person a day, right? $500 a day to spend. You flip low, it's like $25. Some days they would flip $25 and they'd be in a fucking expensive city or 50, you know, they have $50 between them and they'd be scrambling and asking people to sleep, whatever. And they were like, the $25, 50 days were actually better. They interacted with people. They had just richer experiences, you know? I'm not saying it's always a, there, you know, I'm, I'm, money's a tool, right? And like any tool, I was just saying that, like you give somebody a power source, some people will cut off their hands and some people will build a house, right? You got to know how to use the tool. But the bottom line is, is that, you know, my point I was trying to illustrate in a coin flip trip is, is that you can have a rich experience traveling life on any level, this aspect on any level. Right there, if you want to have it, you can find a way to make it happen. You can model it. Now, these guys had to model it on the fly, and that created the drama and all the experiences. But mm-hmm. people watching the show, they learn. They're like, "Holy shit!" You know, "Holy shit!" <laughs> Especially Americans. Like, I went traveling. I see these gap year people from Europe all over the place, and these kids like roaming around and you know, finding hustling, getting jobs, and couch surfing and blah, 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 and et cetera. And they're like, I've been here and I've been there and I've been to this museum and this is free on this. And I saw that and the discount this and the so-and-so. And I'm like, fuck, I ain't done any of this shit. I just stayed in this fancy ass fucking hotel and did one boat trip and you're having a thousand experience points versus my 250. You know what I mean? I'm fucking totally inefficient with my spend converting it into experience points, you know, in my head. Right. And I'm like, fuck, rearrange, rearrange. Thank you for the info. You know? <laughs> so, so, you know, it, it's, 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 really, it's really identifying what you want. You have the res- most, I'd say 90% of the people have the resources or aptitude or ability to live that journey. Hmm. I know people are going to argue and give me shit. Well, I got this and I got that. I'm like, you know, you can have a victim mentality all your mouth, life. Nobody gives a fuck. You're going to die one day and nobody gives a fuck. So you can do something about it. And, and, and choose to live your adventure or you can live with that victim mentality and fucking die one day. Like that's the cold, hard truth. It's like, I might care about you a little bit and somebody else might care about you, but nobody really gives a fuck. It's your own life. You need to take charge. You need to start modeling and you need to get the most out of it. And I want you to get the most out of it. Hmm. Yeah, and the beautiful thing is kind of again, circling back to what you were saying, if you know the question, you can find the answer because there's always an answer. You know, you want to go to St. Bart's? There's many ways. There's many ways. Some of them include almost no money. Yes. You know, I have, have a lot of people who traveled for you know, like a year on almost no budget, visited some of the most beautiful places. I joined my friends um, who were doing a year in New Zealand. I joined them for a trip a few years back. And they were, you know, well, tight budget. So let's just do it simple camping tenting wherever we can and i was thinking to myself like i don't do 
stunting. I, I like my <laughs> nice hotels. I, I, you know, I could, I don't mind. Let's, let's stay there. No, no, no. You're going to love it. And you know what? The first night we stayed in the tent, I realized, fuck the expensive hotels. Because you can't build a hotel in a place where we're tenting. We're tenting Correct. on the you ocean discovered what you, you with discovered. the view of the mountains. Yeah. There's you no hotel. Like- yeah. Life is discovery, right? Like you discover, you, you did something you normally, like, that's one of the things in my life that I, I have to focus on is doing shit that I normally wouldn't do. Think, you know, and, and, and my trip to Croatia was basically going to a place that I would normally wouldn't go out of force because the rest of the countries wouldn't let me in, but Croatia mm-hmm. would fucking loved it. It was awesome. But you, you have to have this kind of pot luck. I remember when I was younger, my, this trader named team Ali used to take his clerks on, on, to someplace on a, on a trip somewhere in the world. They used to spin the globe, and hit the spot, and that's where they would go. And I, I, I one time jumped in on their trip to Prague. I would never go to Prague, but I was like, fuck, I want to go on a Team Ollie, Ollie trip. We, it was like a short trip, flew out. As soon as you land, you're on the tour bus with the lady in Prague, we're all out, whatever. But I had the fucking app, it cracked my eyes open. I was like, oh my gosh, this is way back when. Prague was great, I loved it. I was like, you need potluck in your life. You need some randomness. Otherwise, this is for me. Otherwise, you can't escape your culture. Even the decisions that you think are not the decision you make, it's still somehow influenced by your culture. But if you do something truly random, you'll escape your culture in prior decision making. Right? So hit that fucking random generator button and be like, I'm going to eat here tonight. Hit the random generator button and like, like my next trip is here. I didn't really want to go to Kazakhstan, but here I am in Kazakhstan, you know, and then you have an adventure, right? So, you know, and then who knows, like it could be bad or whatever, but you at least will be off. You will for sure get out of the programming doing that way. And I think it's probably the only way, but you get discovery, you know, you get true discovery and not just extension of what you already been cultured to do. Like, so when I take a trip right now, a lot of it is shit people told me to do, part of my culture. Shit they've already done, part of my culture. What do Americans go? Well, we go to Paris, we go to Italy, we go to Japan, part of my fucking culture. I think I'm making an independent decision, but it's not. It's part of the fucking program. It's just an extension of the tiny line of the program. But if I spin the fucking random number generator around the globe, I'm going to find up someplace. I'm going to be someplace that I would never want to go. Never even think about going. Nobody told me it wasn't part of the culture. It wasn't whatever. I'm fucking there and I'm going to learn and I'm going to discover and it's going to be new and I've escaped. Right? The best plays in poker is when you're completely random at a frequency. Well, the toughest to play against. (laughs) Right. But if you're GTO, right? The GTO, it it runs a random number generator. It's 70%, but it's just random. It's going to be here. It's 50, 50, right? It's, it's, it's going to, it's, it, it runs the random number generator, right? And it goes, okay, I don't care. This is the hand. I'm my bluff frequency is this push the random number generator bluff. It doesn't give a shit. It doesn't care. It doesn't care what you do. It's indifferent. It's completely indifferent, right? You want to have the most robust life, introduce some of that into your life, introduce some of that indifference in your life. And you're going to get some rich experiences. Ah, oh, man. You know what? There's so much to think reading your book. I was making notes, I was highlighting things, I was like circling back to my own experiences and thinking, yes, I had the moment like this as well. I experienced this. You opened my eyes to some such thing. You know, for example, your your um, story of how, you know, once once you got some money already going, life was good, you decided, well, I'm going to give uh, 10,000 to my mother, right? If I, I, gave, I gave it to my grandmother. Grandmother, yeah. right. And so basically, like, eventually she just spends like $50 of it to buy you a, a sweater or you something. Buy me a sweater. Yeah. And, 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 my, and my, my ex-wife just recently corrected me. She said, she also bought two necklaces for your daughters. Oh. With a cross. <laughs> right. she goes, yeah, but that's it. That's all we know. Two necklaces for my daughters with a cross on it. Right. Or whatever. It, it, yeah. So go ahead. Go ahead. Tell, tell no, the story. You, it's just an interesting story. You know, I, I haven't thought about this before I read that. And I was like, Man, because I was recently thinking of like, well, you know what? I'd like to give back to my parents, but then they don't need the extra X amount of dollars. They need 
the tickets to see the grandson. They they need this and the, they need that. You know, this is what matters because the things that they're too lazy to buy themselves or or do themselves, that's right. what matters. Yeah, you you I, I I thought I was being generous. I was really being selfish and lazy. Like what I should have done is like, come on, grandma, I'm gonna take you here. We're gonna go do this, right? Like my mom's 80th birthday. This is a prime example of this. My mom's like, no, I don't want to travel. Whatever. Me and my sister were like, we fucking forced her to go to Scotland to go visit some of the relatives. Whatever. We're like, no, you have to go. We planned it all out. Hauled the whole goddamn family. Went to Edinburgh. Went to a castle. Took a whatever. They're like, best trip of my life. Like best trip for her 80th birthday, right? If I was just like, hey, mom, here's 50k. She would have redid her lawn and it'd be sitting in the bank. I'd get it back when she died. The balance, you know what I mean? Like, mm. it would just be the most lazy gift, right? Like, and, and, but aside from it being a lazy gift, it just let me know, like, this is going to be me. This is going to be me. I, I won't need the money. If I'm saving money for fucking shit like that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to want to sit home and watch Jeopardy. Give gifts to my grandkids and have people visit. You know? And, and, and uh, you know, I, I use kind of the emotional, um, that experience with my grandmother to make it hit home, right? Because you, you identify it with it too, right? We all have all the relatives and we want to give money back and whatever. But it's like, it, the data shows it too. Older people c- cannot accumulate their assets. They don't, Right? their wealth just keeps going up. The reason is they can't spend the fucking money. They can't, even with health costs, everybody's like, what about health costs, core rising? It doesn't matter. The data keeps showing, their wealth keeps going up and they don't spend the money down. They don't, you know, on aggregate, right? Everybody's with my grandma, whatever, a sob story, whatever, I get it, you know? But I'm just saying in aggregate, you just don't do shit. You stop moving. Movement is life. And the less you move, the less you're living. And when you finally can't move at all, you're dead. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and so as you get older, you move less. You want to move less. Not only does your ability and a degeneration change, your attitude, your concept of self changes such so you don't even want to. Right? You used to play tic-tac-toe. It was great. Or play with a red balloon and slide on water slides, right? It was the greatest fucking thing. Like how many adults you see in their front lawn without kids sliding on fucking water slides? It's still a fun activity. I mean, it's kind of fun, but it's like, it's just not as interesting to you anymore. And a lot of life becomes not as interesting to you more. It's a pain in the ass. I don't want to get a chair. I got to fly for three hours and sit, blah, 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 hotel. I don't want to do that. Why can't I just stay here and garden? Why can't you guys just come over with the fucking kids? (laughs) You know what I mean? Like that's, and I was like, that's never going to be me. Never. Ever. What? Fuck those people. What? I'd be doing this. I'd be doing that. And, I, and I'm looking at my relatives and everybody in the family. I'm like, I'm a fucking idiot. This is my genes. This is going to be me. So fucking model your life appropriately. <laughs> you know? Hmm. Oh, man. Listen, this is awesome. I, uh, I'm just sitting there. The wheel, wheels are spinning all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that. it's there. I mean, you'll have, I mean, you, we should be curious people. Um, you know, you gotta have that, cur- you know, you're, you're a curious person. And, and my curiosity led me to this, to these conclusions and, and discoveries and, 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 and writing this book and getting, wanting to get this message out. And you're still mm-hmm. curious, right? Because this is just top level optimization, right? There's optimizations within the optimizations and, and mm-hmm. questions inside that, 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 that keep going on. Right. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, I think let's just say, for example, we find X person. You love this. I think you should travel more. Right. But then there's hacks to traveling. Right. This is a points guy. Like you can get the space and you can do this. You can couch surf. You can do whatever. This is better. You can make your dollar go even further. Hey, if you go do this, there's this company that will pay you to deliver a fucking package hand delivered and you get to go there for fucking free. You know what I mean? And blah, blah, blah. There's all kinds of hacks. Right. You know, and sub-optimization, sub-optimization. But the main thing is the top-level optimization has to be right. Top-level's got to be right. Hmm. Bill, do we have a bit more time or are you... I got, I, I mean, I got a... Uh, hold on, let me see. What time? I got like... I gave you 10 more minutes. All right. Because okay. I obviously want to talk a bit about poker. But before... Because I, I, I don't know. Now I'm torn. I'm going to... 
pitch you both ideas. You decide, right? Because okay. I'm curious about poker. Just you know, obviously the Galphon challenge still going on. Yeah, that's you know, yep. what, what, still what's going, going on, on when there. I can get into a place where it's legal. <laughs> you know, yeah. so that's that's an interesting topic. You know, obviously you recently battling uh, on GG Poker. That that's an interesting topic. And also, but that one, the last one, which I'm going to tell you now, that's obviously a huge topic because I'm still sort of thinking about all these, how do people spend money and why they don't spend money and things like buyer's remorse, remorse for example, right? Mm -hmm. But that's a huge topic. So I don't know if we want to go yeah, yeah. to that one because, you know, that may be for another time if we another ever Another time do. with buyer's remorse, yeah. Yeah, that, that would be awesome. But anyway, let's talk poker. Galphon's challenge. Now, now he started yesterday. He started... Um, against chance yeah their uh challenge kicked off uh did you discuss what what when do you think what's the timeline there with with gal fund yeah, yeah 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 i mean obviously like listen you know there's priorities in my life and there's hobbies in my life and, and poker is is not high up there right i love it love the game but one the powers that be have made it very difficult to play poker <laughs> you know what i mean it just yeah. and it's, 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 you know, I wanted to play it on his site. And as a matter of fact, my account on party poker, which we're playing just got flagged. So I got to go when I'm in St. Kitts and give them like, you know, picture with a new, I got to do all this account validation stuff. And, and, and they have to, right? Like they gotta, they don't want to get slapped by the U S government. I don't want them to get slapped by the U S government. So we have to go through all these hoops and hurdles to play. So the time, you know, we were rocking and rolling when I was in St. Thomas and, 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 and doing it. And then, he got busy and then whatever. And it's just, you know, it really is fucking with us, this ban in the USA, right? Mm. If there was no ban, we'd be playing it tomorrow, you know, the next day. Right. Um, so that, that's the issue. That's the issue with that. All right. Why did you take the challenge in the first place? I, I just, I like challenges. You know, I, I, it's like, I got to cram, I got to learn some concepts in, 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 in whatever. And I, you know, I can get a good price. And I just think I'm not that much of a dog, you know what I mean? In the format that we have, right. Mm -hmm. Um, if I play whatever my a game is at that time, cramming and getting these concepts down. Right. Um, and that's why I took it. I like challenges. I like, you know, one of the things in health, um, in, in dementia and Alzheimer's in dementia, the broad category of dementia, which Alzheimer's is or whatever, but like exercising your mind and playing games is actually good. Being social and playing games and exercising your mind is very good for you. So I'm an egomaniac, just like most egomaniacs. I love challenges. You know what I mean? I like games and puzzles. I'm addicted to games and puzzles, you know, and I was getting good odds. And so I like to be the underdog and come up and be the hero, right? Everybody wants to be Rocky and go to, go to distance, you know? So mm -hmm. I want to go to distance, you know, I want to be the guy, I want to be the, 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 the Frederick Douglass or the so-and-so I want to be the person who overcomes the odds. You know, I like that. And I also like puzzles, mm -hmm. right. And, and, you know, necessity, you know how it is. Like people don't study, they don't go to class. Then they got the fucking test. They're like, ah, I got to study and they're doing thing. They're up all night. Like, it's like, oh shit, I'm about to play the super wizard in Omaha. I better, I better you know what I mean? I better stop fucking around and have some techniques or whatever to get me through this and then, you know, play my game, you know? So that's why. And also I want to help Phil. I think it was very good for Phil. I think he's, he's, he's a great guy. I think it's good publicity for his poker site. I'm a fan of helping po poker and I, I want to help him, you know? I'm, I'm not, I, you know, for me, you know, it's a lot of money, but the stakes are not, they're not consequential to me. Um, and so I, I really want to help the guy. Well, that's a great cause because I like Phil as well. I'm trying to help him as much as I, <laughs> I can. Like Maybe I want to win, but I'd probably just give him the money and invest it in his shop if he wins. I mean, we talked about that briefly. If I win, you know, like, what, well, like, you know, and I'm like, yeah, eventually we'll talk about we'll, we'll, we'll figure something out. You know what I mean? Right. I'm not trying to take Phil's money. You know, I'm trying to take his money, but only to put it back, invest back in him. <laughs> <You know? laughs> well, Phil, thanks for your money. <laughs> you take your money, I'll take a piece of your company and hope you hit a home run, you know, lever it up. Yeah. Like, you know me, I'm about so, leverage. Let's lever this shit up, you know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I see. That's actually an intricate play there. And, I, and Bill, what about poker 
in general? Like, why poker? You say you like games, you like puzzles. Why do you like poker so much? I think I'm curious, and it's a, it's a complex enough game that you're always learning, right? There's always a, le a level, right? It's infinitely, almost, for all practical purposes, it's infinitely complex, complex, but it can be humanized to a level where you can constantly get better, right? With machines teaching us things and concepts and learning and, you know, pre-flop, post-flop, turn, river, then adjusting to your opponent, whatever. There's just enough variables that it always keep it interesting and you can get better and better. So it's not tic-tac-toe, right? You master tic-tac-toe and you're done with it. Like, I don't want to play tic-tac-toe anymore, right? But, um, you know, Parker is more complex and, and it keeps your mind sharp, um, has many uh, applications in the real world, you know, in terms of risk reward, frequencies, indifference, things like that. Um, you know, that, that, that are helpful. And it's, and poker, you know, like golf, like I like golf, right? It's a physical game, keeps you in shape. You know, you, it's you versus the course, right? You just play your game and whatever the other guy plays, that's what he plays, but you're just trying to play your best, right? You're really just playing against yourself. And ultimately poker gets that way too. Even though you're playing the opponent, you know, you, you just play your A game and let the chips, let the variance fall wherever the variance falls. Right. Mm. And so, but poker, live poker is much more social much more social poker. You got golf. You got to be quiet. Like most of the time, you, you know, you hit your shot, you're way over there. That guy's way over there. You know what I mean? You know, there's some talking in the car or the tee, but at poker, you're like 10 hours, 16 hours at a table with all people, all different walks of life have one thing in common. They love playing the game. They love to take risks. They love playing poker. Right. And so you get to meet some of the most interesting people you will ever meet at a poker table. And that's a huge benefit. I mean, it's a, it's a detriment for amateurs, right? Like myself, because, you know, in trading, which I'm a trader, and when I tell the traders, the only reason to be in the trading is to make money. If you're here for the excitement, the drama, the blah, 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 it's gonna fuck you. And you're gonna make bad decisions. We're here to make the money and that's it. And every decision we make is about making money. Everything we do is making about money. Everything we read is to help us to make money, right? And then it would be the same way for a poker professional. Everything I fucking do at this table is to make money. The way I sit, the way I stand, the conversations I talk about, everything should be about to make money, right? That's not me. I'm here to have fun and meet people and blah, blah, blah. So therefore, I'm never, ever, ever going to be optimal of playing a poker game. You know what I mean? I have different ulterior, I have different value coming from the poker table other than the chips, right? But I love it and it's worth it to me. And I honestly, I would say that poker is so niche and so limited in the amount of money you can make that there's more value in live poker and the social than, than, than there is in any money that you can make. You'll make way more money off the felt than you can on. And I'm saying it every stick. Hmm. Right? The business deals I've seen go down, the partnerships I've seen form, the, 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 the latest company I invested in is because I know a guy and he's like, hey, let's come play poker, blah, blah, blah. Sky Dayton. I was like, Sky, what are you invested in? Oh, this flying car company, fuck that shit. Blah, 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 whatever. This satellite company, that's interesting. Tell me about it. What does it do? Blah, blah, blah. It's Swarm, they do tracking, whatever. They're cheap or whatever. I went in. Well, it's kind of full. Fuck that. You're getting me in. Okay, you're in. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'll put, arrange you to talk to the CEO, blah, blah, blah. I just want to put a little bit in. I went fucking in. You know what I mean? You know? You know how levered that is? Versus the fucking poker game. I could have beat everybody out of all their, all their stacks at the poker table, but my, the potential for an investment in the satellite company dwarfs that. I wouldn't even known about that if I wasn't in the social. If I was just like, well, I'm positioned, blah, blah, blah. I'm only going to talk about things that aggravate people to get them on tilt so I can beat them out of money. You know what I mean? If I had that mindset, right? I'd, I'd be going for the small money, not the big money. Or the mm. small experience versus the big experience, right? 
But poker is a pathway. It's a means to uh, keeping my mind sharp, some excitement, some fun, social things, and, and potentially making a little bit of money while doing, while doing all three of those things. Mm. That's for me, you know? I think, you know, to a lot of, for a lot of people is the same thing of it's a pathway that can lead somewhere if you take the right turns, if you make the right decisions. If you're just in that race, in the rat race of like, I'm just po playing poker, that's my thing, like 16 hours a day, poker, 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 seven days a week. You look back at that experience, what was it for? Hopefully not for the money, because there's better ways to make To make money. money. There's way better ways. It's way better ways. It's, it's like, poker is a gladiator sport, much like boxing, right? There's a few boxers who make money, right? And the rest all get knocked out or whatever. They've been better off being a manager at McDonald's. True story, you know? And so poker is the same way. There's a few elite who make an okay living, the de you know, guys who make a living or a decent living or whatever. But when I look at the discipline, money management, intellectual firepower of these people, I'm like, wow, what a waste of resources. You know what I mean? I'm like, you're fucking brilliant, but you're a life idiot. What are you doing? You know what I mean? <laughs> yes, play poker and make your money, but take some time and go and apply that shit over here in the big pond where, you know, you're super levered and you're gonna blah, 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 you know? Mm. You know, nobody hates wasted, everybody hates wasted talent. It's like, oh my God, he could have been a woulda, coulda, shoulda, right? Like everybody hates that. When I, when, I, when I have poker tables and I hear these guys talking and they're arguing and blah, 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 I'm just like, what a fucking bunch of wasted talent. Mm. I mean, that's my internal head, right? I'm not fucking pissing on these guys' dreams or whatever. I'm not going to try and tell them how to live their life. <laughs> well, you right? are now. <laughs> no, I mean, listen, you live the life you want to live. You know, I'm like, I'm just giving you the feedback because I'm on a podcast and I'm supposed right. to tell you what the fuck I think, right? And I'm yeah. just telling you, I'm just like, I see a lot of wasted fucking talent. Hmm. A Did lot you know, of fucking I'm so happy that we came to this because it ties in so beautifully with your book. Because like you said, this book hopefully is going to save, what it, save somebody's life or change somebody's life, right? And what you just said, I'm sure there's going to be at least one guy there or one girl. That's the Joe Farrell moment for them. Yeah. That's your ex-boss telling you, you're a fucking idiot for saving that thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you saying... So somebody who probably needs to hear it, you thinking you're a poker player, spending your whole life full focus on that, you're a fucking idiot, you're wasting your talent. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. I mean, some people, you know, it, 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 they may be the genius, whatever, and, and they can't. Like, they don't have the others, they don't have the EQ and the other stuff to transfer in. But I, I, my personal opinion is like, why is this motherfucker a clerk for me, an analyst, and working his way and learning this? You know what I mean? Like, what? what is, why are they doing this? But you know, I, I get it. Um, one of the things I tell people early on, I was like, if my parents just gave me two hundred to five hundred dollars a week, okay, when I was busting my ass on the floor, I would not have worked hard. I would not have had the ambition or whatever. I would have been golden handcuffed into the easy life, right? So you got these successful poker players, right? They're making six figures, you know, after expenses, whatever, maybe, maybe even more, maybe a half a million, whatever. They're fucking golden handcuffed, right? They're like, they can't walk away. They're addicted. They're sucking on the tit of poker and they can't grow up from mama poker and leave mama poker and go out in the world and stake it because they're golden handcuffed. They're like, I, 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 yeah, you know, it's too risky for them. You know, it's too risk. I can't take that risk, like whatever. But they can always go back to grinding stupid ass poker games. They can always do that shit. They can always have their ego stroked about how bright they are and how great a player they are later on in life, you know? I'm just like, it's a niche that we love. You go on Twitch, right? When Twitch had 100 million people on Twitch, it's probably more now. Poker was 1% of the tags. Fucking a niche of a niche of a niche of a niche that we all love. But 
you know, I, I would expect like the poker wizards, like it isn't true. I don't, I, you know, obviously my expectation smashes, but like, oh yeah, he runs this company, he built this and he's part of that, or he's part of this effort and he did this and whatever. And he's also the poker wizard, but it's not, he's just the poker wizard. Like all that fucking brain power. Hmm. It's like, I don't, I don't get it. I don't get it. I see it sometimes in actors. They're like, yeah, I just didn't want to know, be known as an actor. I went out for whatever and they do these business deals or whatever. But it's like, it's like, okay. You know, they have a talent of, of doing X, Y, and Z. You know? You lever that talent into more hours and they have the experiences they want, <laughs> you know? But here's the, here's the other thing. My theory is puzzles are addicting and the prompts are powerful. So I have a chess app on my phone. And when the prompt used to come up, I was addicted to it. My girlfriend's yelling at me. My kid's like, what the fuck are you doing? You're always playing chess. Because puzzles are addicting. And poker's a big puzzle. And so I, I think part of that is not realizing that even though I'm making money, and even though it's profitable, it's an addiction. It's a beneficial addiction, but it's harmful because it keeps me, it keeps my potential locked up. That's just a theory. I'm sticking to it. Just my theory. Oh, wow, Bill. You know what? I think it's a beautiful place to, to end. Uh, yeah. <laughs> a lot of wheels are going to be spinning right now. And, and mind you, you know, people who want us to expand on that or me to expand on that, because obviously, you know, I, I talk about being a professional poker player, teaching people to be a professional poker player. I don't think it's a horrible cause or whatever but there is one guy more than one guy who needed to hear this message and who's going to snap out of it and if you want to complain about anything just send me a message <laughs> we have a me message. Have catch me to twitter streets whatever i mean <laughs> exactly. yeah, you can here. Listen, listen guy like it's great you can be a great poker player but you know usually if you're a great poker player in the skill sets you're probably great at some other things you probably can apply that anywhere else you know what I mean? It's like the Absolutely. guy with the steadiest hands and the blah, blah, blah. And he's like, well, I, I, I'm the best at threading needles. It's like, you could be a brain surgeon. Like, you could be whatever. <laughs> you know, it's like the things you could do in this world. And you're like fucking playing, you know, you know, entertaining tourists. Right. You know, right. you know you're, you're a glorified entertainer. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, Bill. Yeah. Anyway, thank you so much. <laughs> you got it, buddy. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you'd like to get a regular email from me personally where I share my key takeaways from each latest episode, go to runchexpodcast.com and subscribe to my newsletter. And of course, I would really appreciate if you subscribe to my channel on YouTube and rate my podcast on iTunes, Spotify or any other platform where you normally listen to your podcasts. This really helps.